I'll be honest, I was very apprehensive about doing this because this is one of the masterworks and it's greatly loved by many people. And I thought, my God, this is going to be the death of me. I'm going to get shot at dawn. Uh, if not, I'll be struck by lightning, by a God, if there is one, or Beethoven's spirit itself will come and haunt me. But in fact, it was a very enjoyable experience for me and I was pleased with the result and I learned a lot about Beethoven's music. It was a very good uh, educative experience doing it. Music in Europe in dialogue with Gabriel Prokofiev, British composer and founder of non-classical. Very welcome, Gabriel. What, let me ask you a quite personal question. What means Europe for you personally? Well, um, Europe for me really is, is my homeland because um, I'm actually, I come from five European countries. My mother's English, but my father was Russian and also French, Catalan and Polish. And I've always felt a European, not a British, not a Russian. And so uh, I feel very proud to be European. I, I, it's continually excites and inspires me, the cultural um, history and achievements that we find in Europe, and in particular classical music, the classical tradition. Is, it's a really uh, remarkable tradition to be part of and, to, and also to admire. And um, so Europe, yeah, it's it's where I'm from. I'm also, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm really a fan of, of global culture. And, uh, but I, I'm very happy that I started my life here. I'm very fortunate, I think. Do you see any uh, real European identity? Yes, I do. I mean, and particularly in, in, in classical music, because we find that uh, throughout Europe, all the orchestras and ensembles embrace all classical music, regardless of its actual country of origin. You take a composer like Bach, every classical musician has embraced his music as their own. And I think uh, actually music is where we find an incredible U European unity and, a, and almost a kind of single European voice and a continual cross fertilization of style. And we might say, oh, this composer has a Russian sound, this German, but then you listen to Tchaikovsky and there's a very big German-Austrian influence, Italian as well. And then you listen to um, British composers, even Benjamin Britten, strongly influenced by Russian music. And so there's a, we, we, it's, there's a real melting point, actually. And I think yeah, we do have a strong European culture. And it's a shame when, in recent times, you know, with the fears about European community, there's often too much focus on the differences when the similarities completely outweigh anything else. You were born, born in, in London, but you have a Russian background. Yes. And Prokofiev sounds <laughs> music. It is, yeah. And it has something to do with, with the composer Prokofiev. Yes, yeah. So my, my father, Oleg Prokofiev, was an artist, a painter and a sculptor. And his father was Sergei Prokofiev, the famous Russian composer. Uh, my father was actually born in Paris, in France, because at that period, my grandfather was living in France. Then they returned to Russia. So my father spent most of his life in Russia and then moved to the UK in the 70s, where he met my mother, who's English. And uh, he started a completely new life and had a new family in the UK. He had five children in the UK. And we grew up as Londoners. I don't have a Russian accent. People often expect me to be Russian because of the, the name Prokofiev has strong connotations. And um, really my connection with Russia is primarily through, through the music of my grandfather. And I, I've, I've been to Russia quite a lot in the last few years and I feel a strong connection with Russian culture. But at the same time, I'd say my sort of social background is, is more British, to be honest. And um, I, I plan to spend more time in Russia, actually, because I've had I've such good experiences with music there. How did um, 
the music of your grandfather influence your own artistic vision or artistic identity? Well, it's, um, it's, it works in many different ways, in fact. Um, on the, the, the most obvious and probably most important influence is that I grew up with this music and it's part of, of, of who I am and it, uh, it, his music feels so uh, natural and familiar to me. It, it, it's my grandfather, it would, you know, that, that's it, when it's your fa family is family. And uh, from an early age I heard his music and my father used to take us to many concerts, especially if there was a new production um, that happened in London, we'd go and we'd m sometimes meet the musicians as well. So, um, you know, he, his music was part of my life from, from the very beginning. Then, once I discovered that I had a, a personal passion for music, um, I was really inspired by my grandfather's achievements and uh, I suppose it, it set an incredibly high level, obviously, because he had achieved by the time I was even starting to think about composing, at the same age, he'd already composed a lot and was already a very successful pianist. So it, I, I think it really pushed my ambition and made me never satisfied, really, with um, my own achievements. So it's been a very strong driving force. Also, it's probably it's intimidated me as well. I think I was quite shy about performing because I felt that I was expected to be an instant virtuoso and, of course, we know that behind every brilliant musician is a hell of a lot of hard work and, um, and you know, real dedication. And I, I, that maybe affected my confidence to, as a performer. But I found with composition, I was able to completely, I'm able to immerse myself in the act of composing. And then I forget who I am, really. I just compose. And it's interesting sometimes um, influences of my grandfather's music come out in my own music and at times I've I've been doing some sketches and I hear something that's more like Prokofiev sound and then I would normally shelve it I think well no I want to keep my own identity but sometimes I let that come out and so um, yeah, there's an interesting relationship there I think probably as I get older I feel more open to allow influences of his style but obviously his melodic style is quite different to the contemporary music of our times. So that in itself is an interesting uh, debate for myself, how melodic to make my music. For me, it's quite a natural thing to write music with some element of melody and rhythmic energy. So I, yeah, that, that comes through in, in some ways. Yeah. So uh, you started playing instruments by your own, but but nowadays you are more you see yourself as a composer. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what happened? I mean, as a child, like many many children, um, I learned the piano and then the the trumpet, and then I changed to the French horn. I played in many orchestras. I sang in choirs, and this was an incredible experience for me growing up because I you know the, being part of an orchestra is really, as we know, it's one it's one of the most thrilling things, and I, it's something I really hope. Um, can increase rather than decrease that is the kind of worrying tendency nowadays with less emphasis on music education. Um, but in fact my parents, my father being a particular, being a, an artist trying to make his own career outside the shadow of his very, very uh, famous father, he, he, he was always looking for his own identity and he, did, he didn't want his children to feel in any way pressured by their heritage. And so um, he, there was no pressure from me or any of my brothers and sisters to study music. And in fact, I started composing by writing pop songs with a friend. I had a friend called Nathan Cooper, who at 10 years old, we wrote a pop song, and then we performed it in front of our school friends in the school assembly. And that began a long um, uh, period throughout my teen years, into my 20s, writing pop songs and playing in bands. And it, I didn't even connect that with my grandfather, in fact. This was just something different. And because it wasn't the same kind of music, but it was through that I discovered the joy of creating music. And one minute you're sitting at the piano, five minutes later, suddenly from nowhere has come a fantastic, or you think so anyway, an inspiring melody or a, a rhythm or a certain harmonic progression. 
And this, when I discovered this magic, the, the thrill of doing this, that, that drew me into composition. And then I started doing classical composition as well in my studies at school. And I found that even more exciting. In, then I, when I studied at university, I still had some, I suppose some, uh, and as a teenager, I had some uh, intimidation about entering classical music with this feeling the pressure of my family heritage. But I, I just, I couldn't really stop the, my enthusiasm for it. And I've just kept pushing and I've done other work as a producer as well, producing all kinds of hip hop music, electronic music. And I found that very inspiring as well. But ultimately I've found myself drawn to classical music. And I think that the, within that tradition, there's an emphasis on a real artistic freedom and taking your listeners on a, on a journey, not just entertaining them with a, with a song or a kind of, you know, a, a moment of excitement, but actually trying to do something that has a, a more sense of development and something that is, has a longer form, a longer structure. And I do find that ultimately more, more exciting. Though I'm still um, strongly influenced by, by um, a lot of other genres of music. Your music is European. Yeah. And there's one piece you made a remix on Beethoven 9 on the yeah. European FM. Yeah. What is it about? Okay, so um, this is, a, uh, was, is quite an unusual project that I did three years ago. I was asked to compose an orchestral, or maybe I should say symphonic remix of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Now, I'll be honest, I was very apprehensive about doing this because this is one of the masterworks and it's greatly loved by many people. And I thought, my God, this is going to be the death of me. I'm going to get shot at dawn. Uh, if not, I'll be struck by lightning, by a god if there is one, or Beethoven's spirit itself will come and haunt me. But in fact, it was a very enjoyable experience for me, and I was pleased with the result, and I learned a lot about Beethoven's music. It was a very good uh, educative experience doing it. What I did is I took the score of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, just the last movement, because obviously the symphony is very long. I wasn't going to do a full kind of hour-long remix. The last movement itself I think is 28 minutes so I did a remix of about 28 minutes or 25 minutes and I studied the score really carefully and I looked the score the the, the last movement itself is made up I think it's six six seven sections and so I took each section and took the score of each section and literally remixed it as if I was in a studio with electronic music, but using some theme and variation classical techniques alongside more modern cut and paste studio techniques, but with the score. So for example, um, I took the opening and I changed the this powerful harm, this kind of, at Beethoven's time, this threatening um, timpani roll with, the, with all the um, brass, da 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 but I turned it into really, this is 21st century environmental meltdown and put it all in the low register of the orchestra, dissonant harmonies, full percussion, and then brought in then the cello solo, but then I caught it in a loop, put it into some kind of more broken, syncopated rhythmic um, loop so I had a lot of fun, really. It was, it was a bit... And then later, I, the piece took a kind of musical journey. Later, I did some certain techniques to the, to the theme, the Ode to Joy theme in instrumental version and augmented it, diminished it, and suddenly found it sounding a bit like Stravinsky, for example. And then at the very end, then when we actually have the Ode to Joy, I didn't have a choir because we didn't have the, the facility for the choir to learn new parts. So several months before I recorded a cappella choir singing the Ode to Joy, and I had two percussionists playing samples taken from the choir on uh, um, electronic xylophones controlling the samples, and they were processed and sometimes stretched to create long drones, and then at the very end, elements of the Ode to Joy start to appear in the texture. So um, 
we just about hear the, the ode to joy at the end of the piece, but I didn't, so it's, sorry, I've kind of <laughs> explained it too long. I don't, it's, hard to, it's hard to do it in a nutshell. But it, my, I did a symphonic remix of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and it was a, um, it, it, in a way, it's, it, it, it's a piece that reveals all the inner elements, the inner workings of this great masterwork. It's like, it's sort of like a, a guide for the young, for the 21st century generation of the contents of Beethoven's Ninth. And it's a homage to that piece. I don't think it damages that piece because I didn't destroy every copy of the score or burn it down or anything. I just did a new piece that uses all the different materials from there and, it, and shows it in a new light. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun piece. You mentioned you left the traditional classical path. Mm, yes. What, what happened? I mean, how did it came that you, you were interested in, in hip-hop, for example? I think um, I was, as a, as a teenager, I was open to all types of music. And, and living in London as well, when you live in a big city, you can't really hide from music. You hear all different genres. And, I was a teenager in the um, in the late eighties, early in the early nineties, and um, this is when there was this rise of electronic dance music in Europe, this rave culture, and that was a very exciting time. And it was, on one hand, people didn't take it very seriously. On the other hand, there was a music a period becoming a new popular styles of music that didn't have melody or didn't follow traditional harmonic um, patterns that we'd, which had been the, the way in previous pop music. So I, I was aware of some really exciting things happening in, in popular music. Also, I'm, I'm very interested in rhythm and I found in, in hip hop music and in various types of dance music, you know, really interesting new approach to, to rhythm, often driven by technology, often driven by computers and drum machines even. And you find new rhythmic idioms and um, approaches emerging because of developments in technology and this strange kind of exchange between human and machine and um, some really organic and, and un, um, non, uh, non unconscious, can we say, an unconscious um, um, evolution of music I found in popular music and I was really drawn to that and I wanted to be part of that and actually personally be involved in that energy and so I was playing in bands. Also, um, when I I, st uh, when I, was, I studied a degree in composition and then a master's, and what also happened there is I, that when I was doing the master's, that's when I was really dedicating myself to contemporary classical music, but I also felt a frustration with the contemporary classical scene. It, there, was, there was a group of us all post-grad composers. We would have concerts and seminars of our work, and Though we were in a big university, you know, I don't know, it was York University, I think 10,000 students, you know, many young people, you, know, you just have a handful of people at the concerts. And I was, uh, and, and even external concerts of, of, of contemporary music, there were, it was always felt like such a, a niche crowd. And, it, and I, I found it so strange, really, that we were these young artists experiencing the same as our um, peers, but we weren't they weren't coming to listen to our music, yet we were expressing things that could be interesting to them. And so after I finished my master's, I was quite frustrated with the classical scene. And I felt with music, it, it's about communicating. It's about an artist sharing their visions, their ideas, their art with, with a public. And I want, particularly wanted to share it with my, my age group, people who would really appreciate it, and a wider audience. And so then I went back actually to producing um, grime, uh, which is a, a form of British hip hop. I also played in an electro band, a punk funk band. And I went back into that because I wanted to kind of really live, be playing, performing and creating music that was, that was living not just once every six months when you had a recital, but every week that was out and about. And we toured around Europe and I really, and um, you know, the, the, I really got into that world, but ultimately I found it frustrating and I, artistically I wasn't satisfied. And then I went back to classical music, but with a kind of, with a vengeance 
or with a, 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 a increased awareness of what I'd seen outside the classical world and what we could bring, mm-hmm. bring, bring what, what, what could actually work. Maybe, you know, maybe we could apply some of the things from the other genres in the classical world. And that's when I formed non-classical. Well, what is the background of non-classical? I mean, uh, would you agree to say that non the, the idea or the vision of non-classical is to bring classical music more close uh, to people and to the daily life? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, um, as, as I said earlier, I th- you know, there's this strange situation where you have a lot of young musicians, a lot of young composers, and... Um, then they're, they're performing to, in the classical world, they're performing to a really dedicated and a, and a serious audience, a traditional classical audience, and we should never take that audience for granted. But the, the strange thing is, is in that audience, there are very few people of their generation. And um, this, I find, a, a really um, bizarre and sort of a, um, bewildering situation or an unnatural situation, really, I think, is, is something that's really driven me, that you know, we, the young musicians and composers, should want to share it with, with their generation. And uh, non-classical, it's called non-classical because the, the approach of non-classical is to present classical music in a non-classical way, or we could say a non-traditional way, and um, therefore release classical music from the stigma and the, this... Um, cliched, old-fashioned image that is associated with it, especially for people who don't know classical music and haven't even been to a concert, because this is the problem that classical music faces, is that unless someone, a a young person, has grown up in a family who go to concerts and it's something they've done as a child and they, they, they kind of, they understand the culture of classical music, it's something a lot of people will never do. And they'll, they'll probably have a very, a, a really um, twisted perception of what classical music is. And when they do dare go to a concert, they'll find a lot of st- um, things that intimidate them and they don't feel comfortable with the formality, the how to behave, when to clap, etc. And um, it feels like a, a very old fashioned experience for a lot of people. So, but that has nothing to do with the music. And so the whole point with non-classical is to say, Classical music actually can be appreciated by anyone, and, I, and I'm, it's proven many people who have never heard classical music, once they actually get a, a proper experience of it, they, 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 they can't believe what they've been missing. But the, the problem is to do with the presentation, and so that was the aim of non-classical. The, 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 I can explain a, the, the, a simple story to the, why I did the first non-classical club night, was that I'd after having this break from composing classical music in 2003, I composed my first string quartet, and I was really keen for my friends to come to this concert. Partly because the quartet was a classical quartet, but it, it in, there were, I'd some influences from the syncopations of, of dance music and of, of garage music, for example, had somehow filtered into this quartet. I hadn't done it in a conscious way. It was it, that was just my musical language at the time, and um, I thought my friends will really like this piece. They must come down. And the concert was a traditional Sunday lunchtime chamber recital, and I invited a lot of friends. And surprise, surprise, one friend came, and I was really disappointed. I mean, we had a good audience, and the concert was a success, but. Personally, I had this regret that, you know, why, why, do, why, don't my, why don't my friends come? Because I'm talking about friends who weren't classical musicians, you know, because often that's the case. You know, not everyone you know is going to be involved in the classical scene. And, um, and thank God, actually, that I did have friends outside the classical world because that's what gave me this thought that I need to then take the music to them. Where do they go for music? They go to clubs, they go to gigs, they go to bars. So I said, well, I just have to put on the, the same string quartet in a bar, in a club. And we have to start it at nine o'clock, like you do with club music. We need DJs. And so suddenly it became a bit more complicated. I had to conceptualize how can we put on classical music in a club. I think at the time, there may, you know, in London, 
I'm not I don't think it was necessarily the first time someone had done a classical music in a club, but I hadn't been to anything like that. So for myself, I was just trying to work out my own solution to this problem. And I couldn't find a DJ because I didn't want someone to play techno or R&B or hip hop when then they're going to have a classical string quartet. So I had to DJ. So then that started my career as a DJ as well. I had to mix contemporary classical music with some left field electronic music. And, um, and then we made flyers and posters like it was a normal club night. We had some good press support. Fortunately, the Elysian Quartet who performed at that event, they were residents at Trinity College of Music who had quite a good PR department and they helped. And we got some good national press. And lo and behold, we had about 200 people all 18 to 30 years old, just a young crowd, and the night was a real success. And it was quite, it seemed quite simple to me. And I sort of expected after that, that suddenly these clubs would pop up everywhere. And that didn't happen straight away. And so I kept doing the non-classical nights. And then after about four years, I think in, that was 2004, so 2008, I started doing a monthly non-classical club to make a statement that a classical, having classical music outside the concert hall is not like a one-off sort of, you know, weird kind of crazy classical club thing. It's very normal and it's actually just a quite acceptable and proper way of, of enjoying classical music and saying, look, classical music is for everyone. It should just be part of your routine. It's there every month, come along and enjoy it. It's not something you have to, you know, obviously you want, things to have a sense of occasion and hopefully every month it is a sense of occasion but it's something that's just part of everyone's lives. Does it mean that programs had not been announced or are not announced in detail or? No we tend we always try to announce in advance and we try to advertise properly and everything. Now you you've got to maximize the appeal of each event. The main point is to have it every month is to have a presence a permanent presence in the, the, the geography of the nightlife of London, rather than being a sort of a, a flash in the pan, some kind of one-off thing, which often seems to be, that seems to be a trend in contemporary classical music. We always talk about world premieres. We always talk about special festivals about this composer, and then it's over. You know, it, everything's the one occasion it's a living art form. The composers don't suddenly disappear. You know, they're there, they're working, they're composing all the time. Same with the musicians. And that's how it should be functioning. And after doing the monthly club, now it's 10 years since the first and then six years since the first monthly. Now in London, in fact, there are more and more of these regular classical clubs. And I think, I hope that non-classical has somehow given confidence to people that this is a, is a viable way of presenting classical music. And in fact, there are different promoters, all with a different approach. We have the DJs, we have a certain way of programming the nights. Other composers and ensembles are doing a different kind of event. And uh, so it's, it's, I think it's, it now feels that there's a new generation of classical musicians and composers and promoters who are realizing that we can make classical music have a vibrant life outside the concert hall and a life that does fit into the lifestyles of, of, of young modern generations who, who often it's as simple as the fact they finish work too late to get to the concert hall in time because people's lifestyles have changed. You know, you, personally I've missed so many first scenes of ballets or first movements of symphonies because it's, I've, I'm, I often don't quite make it for 7.30 to the concert. How is non-classical seen by, by the real classical scene? I think generally uh, in a positive way because I think uh, we've, we've had, in terms of, for example, we've had classical musicians, we've had more established classical musicians perform at non-classical as well as m young musicians at the very beginning of their career. Generally, we focus on the young, on the, on the younger musicians um, because we want to support the, you know, the, the emerging artists and, and the young composers. But I think um, we, a priority of non-classical is to take the music very seriously and always make sure that we have high quality of performances 
and a really interesting choice of repertoire. And um, we, the performances at non-classical are always um, serious classical performances. We're not, it, because it's in a club, it, that doesn't mean that the live performances are crossover or are mixing um, pop and classical, not in the slightest. The, 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 the live performances are always um, well-rehearsed, serious performances of contemporary repertoire, whether it's classic repertoire from the 20th century of established composers like Zanakis or Ligeti or Stravinsky even, or, um, or Steve Reich, um, or more modern composers, whether it's older generation like Lachenmann or younger composers, Tansy Davis, um, for example. Um, you know, the, 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 we always focus on, on high quality performance because this is the strength of classical music. The, 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 the level of musicianship and talent is, is so high. And that's why another thing that drives me really, that, that I, I can't believe it that there are so many people who don't actually get a chance to experience the amount of talent we have in the classical scene. And that's why we, it's our duty to make it so much more available to people. And, and it has to be done in a serious way. Um, so I think people from the classical institutions, when they look at what we're programming, they see that we're serious and, and, and they, they're, they're glad to see that we are reaching a new audience. I think probably some people are, are maybe sceptical as well because they think, can you really have a serious, a proper concert in a nightclub? I would, they need to come and experience it firsthand to, to understand that. Sometimes we might have a, some repertoire might not work so well in a club because the acoustic in the nightclub is not the same as the Wigmore Hall, for example. But, and we sometimes we have to amplify, though we do it very carefully. We always just use it just to fill the room, just increase, just so we, we get, make up for our acoustic defects in the space. Um, but we find that the public tend to be quiet as well. That was always a question people would say, but they said, but you're doing it in a club, you know, and the people are drinking. But how, how, how can you listen? Isn't everyone chatting? The, that, that's the, the power of, of, of brilliant classical musicians. You have someone on a solo violin in a crowded club, the moment they start playing, everybody falls silent. And particularly to do with the intimacy, you know, often the crowd will be standing just a meter or two from the performer. And you know, it's absolutely captivating because you, to be so close and feeling more personally, more, more intimate with the performer as well. They're not, there's not the formality of a seated concert where you're sometimes quite far away and there are um, strong lights, the performer walks on in a kind of formal and stiff way. They don't say much. You know, we always try and encourage the performers to talk before they perform. So you, you actually, you know, you get sometimes, I, 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 there's some plenty of performances I've witnessed at non-classical that I found m more thrilling and more exciting than ones I'd heard in brilliant acoustics in, in famous concert halls. Um, so I, I think generally, you know, there's a positive reaction. We have the DJing in between the live sets. That might disturb some more conservative public, of course. But the idea of the DJing is to, is to really create a whole night and create a feeling that you're in, you have a whole, um, a whole experience and change the environment. Um, so the moment you walk in the door and you get a drink in the bar, you hear De a, a unusual kind of bar music. Yeah, you can hear there's some electronic sounds or some beats, but then you hear unusual harmonies and you hear classical instruments. You don't hear a singer, you hear um, strange textures and you think, wow, okay, this is different. I'm not in a normal bar. And in fact, the idea, the, my initial concept for the D, why, why would you have a DJ at these events is to try and get the audience's ears in ready, warm up their ears so they're ready for contemporary classical music, for new music, for music that might be quite challenging. If you go to a, you come off, you, let's say you go to a normal recital, you come off the street, you know, you're, you're looking forward to the concert so you're kind of prepared, but you, 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 you come in cold, you just sit down, boom, you're hit by the music. And it can take a while to kind of get in the mood. Ideally, the idea with the, the non-classical DJ is that they already get your ears in the direction of a classical performance. 
though they don't, though what they're doing, they're not the performance. The DJ is, is setting the mood. Some people come and they, list, they just sit and listen to the DJ because they're really interested to hear this kind of new approach. The, often we, most of the music that we DJ is remixes of contemporary classical music. And so, they, they, so that's an interesting thing in itself. I suppose some of the remixes have heavier bass. It, you know, it's designed to work in a club. And that could you know, be upsetting for, for some audience members. But generally, I think people, people like that. And um, it's become an important part of the night. We have, we have the live performances, then short DJ set, then live performance, short DJ set. We normally have four live performances, all of about 20 minutes long, in fact. The regular or the, the traditional uh, classical concert promoters, they are losing audience. And audience development is quite important and, and a big question mark. Yes. What, what would be your advice for, for the traditional promoters of festivals? Well, it is difficult because um, at the, um, the, the, a lot of, some of the really traditional venues they, they just feel so far removed from a lot of people's lifestyles that they wouldn't even consider going into those venues and therefore they wouldn't probably even look at the programs. So there, there's definitely, a, there's, a, there's a big challenge there. I mean, I think um, it is to do with, it's partly to do with the programming and making sure that they, they can program music that somehow connects to something in the, in the, uh, the younger audiences' lives, and um, one thing we found with non-classical is we've been we've started doing some bigger events, a kind of series of three or four events over a week's period, and using some larger venues and trying to find a narrative, some theme that will draw that will create a kind of talking point and a point of entry for the concert. So we've done two we did two series called the Pioneers of Electronics. Pioneers of electronic music, sorry, and pioneers of percussion, and in both we focused on the classical repertoire, classical re electronic repertoire. So Messiaen Oraison, which is really the first, probably the first composed electronic piece from 1937. You know, and you ask someone on the street, so you know, what's the early electronic music? They say Kraftwerk, which is from the 70s. In fact, classical music was was there first, and what we did is we did bring in some elements from electronic music that people that was less classical as a way of appealing to the crowd but electronic music instantly had a lot of interest from the audience outside classical music because there's a big public for that and they were very curious to learn more about classical music that was electronic with percussion as well we were we drew on percussion music from other traditions such as taiko drumming and west african percussion and um, so it, it's these kind of strategies, I think, when you actually try and think of, um, rather than focusing on the composers or on a style of music, which is the traditional classical approach for programming, and this alienates an audience who don't know anything about classical music. If you tell them it's about romantic composers, that just doesn't mean anything to, to, to someone who hasn't studied music. And this is part of the problem that within the classical scene, everybody working has studied music and they take a lot of their knowledge for granted and that therefore alienates a new audience and it's a shame because the audience would love the concert so sometimes it, it, could, it can be when you connect maybe a, 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 write, a playwright or a filmmaker we did another concert when we had we called it uh, what do we call it sonic visionaries and we had music um, we had Penderecki uh, Threnody for victims of Hiroshima and Ligeti Lux Eterna both pieces were used in films of Stanley Kubrick. So that was a connection point for, for a public who, and who knew that music as well. You know, this, I mean, that's a very famous example. But um, I think these approaches, also doing late night events are very important. Having less formal events in the foyers, trying, trying DJs as well, it can be good. And then sometimes they're, they're, you can go further. You can also connect with musicians from other genres. There are a lot of musicians involved in electronic or popular music who, who love classical music, and you can invite them as co-curators or something, and again, that creates a connection. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of strategies, and um, 
the main thing is is to we need to kind of recognize that we the classical world we are we are in our in our bubble and um we we just in our the way we express ourselves we take a lot of knowledge for granted and for you as a composer with with this popular mu music experience mm. uh does it wrote you more in the direction to be popular in your compositions or back to classical? Hmm. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, um, for me, with composition, I mean, I think it's, you have to be very careful if you set out too many um, aims in what you're trying to achieve with a piece. And if you try and set yourself too many criteria, because then you, can, you, you, you risk kind of killing this kind of natural and instinctive inspiration that I think is, is key to, to writing exciting and, and, and natural and good music. Um, you know, if, if you think, okay, I'm going to compose you know, a piece that's really gonna excite the young audience, you've kind of already set yourself up to fail. So I mean, I don't consciously ever think, right, I'm gonna incorporate this and this. My, my compositional approach actually is to do a lot of sketches. I just, in a, in a very, in quite quickly and in a very free way. And, I, and if I do a lot of sketches, then I don't put any um, pressure on myself because I know many of the sketches I can just discard and I don't really think about what's going to happen to them. But while I'm doing the sketches, I'm often in a certain a mental state or or in a or I'm think I'm reading a certain book or I'm I am thinking of the theme of the piece of an overall I have an overall vision but I'm not consciously channeling the vision into the sketches and there's a lot of subconscious things going on because I've um because I'm really I'm really interested in a lot of the rhythms and sounds I hear in electronic music and dance music and that excites me it, it, it that excitement is there and it just happens in my music and sometimes once I've done the sketch and I realize, okay, yeah, this clearly has an influence from some electronic music, then I then some slightly more conscious, I suppose, the more classical mind comes in and you start analyzing, I start analyzing my sketch and then thinking, well, where should I take this? What am I, what structure is this going to take? What are my possibilities? And then I also, but then sometimes I have to back off. I don't want to, you don't want to overwork an inspired idea as well. I mean, I've, um, I've got different examples in my um, second string quartet. It opens with a, a movement that's clearly inspired by electronic programmed, kind of computerized, very rigid music. And I was really fascinated to see what would happen if a string quartet, human beings, recreated the kind of this Un unhuman, um, repetitive um, electronic sound. And I, I, so with the quartet we worked, with the Elysian Quartet, we worked quite hard to try and find this very short, staccato, dry sound. Initially I wanted them to do a pizzicato, but it, it didn't work. And they found this very, very dry, short sound. And so you have a, a, a piece that only exists because of electronic music, actually. So it's sort of this strange kind of taking an influence from electronic. But then in terms of the structure, I, um, I didn't follow a, 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 there's no verse or chorus, there's no sort of pop structure. It follows a freer, um, um, I suppose a sort of ternary form, but it follows a freer sense of development. And, um, but it came initially just from a sketch, from something I was trying out. And in the, my, the, I've written a concerto for turntables, which is a direct connection with hip hop music. In the third movement, it has a, a very slow kind of hip-hop groove. But the, the, that, that idea for the groove, I didn't sit down and think, okay, now I'm going to do like a hip-hop groove because it's got to be for the turntables. I, just, I was um, just coming back from a friend's wedding in Malmo in Sweden, and I just suddenly had an idea for, a, for this kind of cool groove that I imagined on double basses, and I sung it into my iPhone, or not yet, no, that maybe it was even before, that was probably before iPhones. I sung it into the phone, I, yeah, I sung it into the Nokia I had at the time. And um, then later, I, I wrote, I, when I had the chance, I listened back and I wrote down the melody. And then I realised that's perfect for the third movement of the concerto. So, and then I thought, yeah, and it's got the hip-hop thing, that's what I was looking for. So it's, you know, it's, um, 
I try to be, I think the thing is to be organic, to be natural. Because of non-classical, you're very close, to, uh, I assume, to the young generation. Um, I try. I'm, I hope I'm not losing <laughs> touch as I get older. What, yeah. what would be your advice for young talents, uh, students at the music university, just, you know, uh, focused on practicing, but, but, you know, worry about the future? What, what would be your advice? Well, I, I think um, the... When you're a young young musician or young composer, you 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 have to you have to be practical and realistic, and you have to think, um, you know, the ult, you, you, whatever your dreams are, your ultimate dreams are of success. That what it's about is playing your music and reaching people, and there's no point in just practicing and sort of hiding yourself away for that special day when you do your big concert. You should really be out there sharing your music with people as much as possible and you, you you need to as soon as any piece of music is ready you should be performing it a lot you shouldn't just wait for the designated recital and so I, I, the, 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 my thing my advice really would be would be just to get out there and gig and the initial thought would be but, but where and how well you have to be Confident if you believe if you're, you're you're playing your instrument because you believe in it and because you love it So you shouldn't you should you shouldn't be shy about playing anywhere really so why not? Think choose some repertoire that's dynamic and um, Shows your skills and is exciting and go and play at an open mic alongside folk musicians jazz musicians Some venues might not like it, but you're sure to find be able to persuade people You know that, so I would say the thing is just to get out and gig even better is to try and put on your own gigs, like what I did with non-classical, and, and, and a lot of people are doing that now. And a good way of doing that is to form a collective club together with other composers, other musicians, and form a team of you and put on regular gigs. Especially when you're a young musician, you're not, you don't need, you're not desperately trying to earn money from your performance, especially if you're still studying. So that's a really, really good opportunity to actually not worry about whether you were paid well for the gig, just get out there and do the exposure. And what you'll learn from playing to new audiences and playing more will, will be invaluable really, because I think we often, we hide away too much. And with composers as well, they're just not getting enough performances. And every time a piece is performed, you learn more about it. And, and, and that's incredibly valuable for the composer to, to, to feel how it's working with the audience. So uh, yeah, th th that's, that's the main thing. And then obviously there are all the new media, all the online resources that, that you can you know, get involved in and, and you should film, film yourself in any kind of way. I mean, there's not classical music, uh, the presence of classical music on YouTube is it's there and you can find most repertoire, but often many great pieces only have a couple of performances and often the quality isn't so good. So that's also, there's, there's a lot of, um, Opportunities actually waiting for, for, for young musicians and, and, and they just they need to take the their, their their career side as seriously as they're practicing, which is Benedict is something you said yesterday. They should be spending an hour a day on their career plan. You know, however many hours on practicing, but actually timetable and time for for, for, for thinking about how you're actually getting your music out there because otherwise it's it's it's, it's it is madness and it, and it reflects that i think the madness of the current situation that we have so many there are so many talented musicians working so hard composers spending weeks finishing scores the, the kind of detail and 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 dedication and then one performance i mean it, it makes me uh, just saying it i find it upsetting that that so many classical new, mu new music pieces get one performance and a repeat performance is kind of considered quite special. I mean, you, it, everything should get 10 performances minimum, you know, but it's, it, but, but and the, the only person, the only people who are gonna make that happen is, is us, the composers and the musicians, really. We, we, we can't wait for some kind of fairy godmother to do that. Do you think young talents, they should just not wait for the audience, but they should try to catch the audience. Yeah, I think um, 
they do need to. I mean, it, it's the problem is it's hard work. I from doing the non-classical nights. Um, you know, I built up. A, there's a, a re, we have a really strong team now. There's 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 four of us involved putting on the nights, and even with four of us, we have to work really hard every month to get a crowd down. And and I've had it experienced it firsthand a few years ago when I was really doing it just myself or with just one other person. You you can't that and that's a problem because if you're trying to work on your music, then to worry about promoting gigs is hard. But you know you. It's really worth it's really worth the effort trying to get the word out, and um, the more it happens, the more the scene will grow. That's why it's good to to try and build a team because then you can share the the responsibilities, and um, but you need to go yeah you need to go out. You can't wait to be booked. It, it, it it's silly if your piece is ready. Your it's not just a, a shame for the musician; it's a shame for the public. Just to think now that there might be some musicians. Who are performing some, um, you know, who've got a fantastic performance of a I don't I don't know you know a um, Bartok string quartet, and nobody's hearing it. Maybe one maybe it was performed they performed it one recital. Why don't they perform it ten times? You know everyone's going to love it. There's a fear: will you get an audience every time? Maybe not. Maybe you can't get that many gigs, but you've got to try and and, and just get out get out more. Say so, you know, there's plenty of venues, but the the focus tends to be on more on pop and singer songwriter stuff. Yeah, you know, and and I think there's there's no reason why classical musicians can't. They have to choose the right repertoire as well. Obviously, you can't. There's certain pieces won't work in certain venues, and but that's not a compromise. That's just intelligent programming, and and that's another thing. We don't. We shouldn't be too precious, because again, that's another attitude that's sometimes holding. Classical music back. Gabriel, thank you very much for this inspiring conversation. Oh, you're welcome.